Okay, the next report we have for Council is on uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, the Atlas project was begun, I believe, in 2005. Uh, it's a massive multi-omic study that had an overarching goal to define the molecular genetic changes associated with a, a whole slew of different cancer types. The NHGRI production sequencing centers were uh, tremendously involved in this project and many aspects of the project, but most notably in the data production work. So we thought it was appropriate to uh, uh, bring a presentation to the Council. I think the production work stopped in 2015. Carolyn can clean up any of my <laughs> mistakes that I make in the intro. Some of the analysis work is uh, continuing, so we thought it was an appropriate time to do this. And what better person than our own Carolyn Hutter, who probably gave a couple of years of her life to the coordination and management of this project when she worked at NCI. So, Carolyn? Thank you. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm going to be giving an overview of the Cancer Genome Atlas, a decade of discovery. I guess we're actually into the second decade, with it being 2017. But um, so the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA as I'll call it, was a joint project between the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute. The mission, as I have outlined here, was to really take a comprehensive look to accelerate our understanding of the molecular basis of cancer, taking a number of genomic analysis technologies, including large-scale genome sequencing. This is a picture down here of me, Carolyn, with my coworkers at NCI, Tiffany and Audrey, and we cheated with Liz Galanders, showing our base pair pride and TCGA order at the NHGRI symposium exhibit. Um, downtown. So TCGA <coughs> came, came about in this comprehensive way to look at over 10,000. The number actually wound up, the, the goal was 10,000. The final number actually wound up being 11,000 tumor normal tissue pairs from participants with 33 different types of cancers, including 10 rare cancers with seven different data types. And I'll go into what those data types are in a couple of slides. Um, the start of the project and where sort of this decade <laughs> of discovery really came out of these two um, seminal activities in, in 2005. One was a report to the National Cancer Advisory Board, and the second was a meeting about a comprehensive genomic analysis of cancer. And at that time, what came out of this was the development of the pilot phase of TCGA. Um, and the pilot phase was designed as a collaboration, again, between NHGRI and NCI to test the feasibility of taking a genomic approach to cancers, starting with three cancers, brain, um, ovarian, and why am I, and why did I just space out on this? Lung, thank you, lung cancer. Um, and really the complexity, the idea was that the complexity of cancer really required this comprehensive look at the genomic al um, alterations to really think about understanding cancer and thinking about medical solutions and new medical approaches to cancer. I always like to sort of put this 2006 pilot phase start in per perspective, and one of the ways to do this is to look at where we were in the idea of genome sequencing and the cost of the genome. So this is the iconic NHGRI cost per genome um, <coughs> Um, chart showing when this project started, the cost to do whole genome sequencing was about $10 million. And the reason I do this is I think it shows the audacity and sort of the vision of this project. I also think it's important because I get a lot of people coming with these very 2016 glasses or 2017 glasses and being like, why didn't you guys whole genome sequence everybody in TCGA? And it's like, well, yeah, if we started TCGA today, we would have done such things. We didn't start TCGA today. We started TCGA at a time where we weren't even whole exome sequencing anybody. We were starting with a candidate gene approach, and the project really evolved with the technology. And a major part of that involving was three years later after the end <laughs> of the sort of pilot phase with the expansion phase. And the expansion phase was, in, was brought about by two, three things. One was the success that was found in the pilot. Two was sort of the evolving technology and the recognition that there was more, could, more that could be done. And finally, three was 
as many of us know, 2009, 2010 was when the RS stimulus funding happened, and that actually allowed a fair amount of money to be brought in to really jumpstart this project from a pilot phase to a full phase, which at that point had a goal of doing 10,000 tumor normal pairs in 20 different cancers. And the thought at that time is the expansion phase of TCGA was really going to bring a quantum leap in our understanding of cancer. And by having this molecular characterization on that number of individuals and that number of different cancer types, we could really change how we think about and understand the molecular basis of cancer. Um, as Rudy noted, the production for the project ended in 2015. At that point, we sort of tied up the, the last bits. There was a little bit that went into like January, February of 2016, but we did a pretty good job of hitting that 2015 um, deadline for production. But one of the things to think about is, and this is a quote from John Weinstein, our current um, steering committee chair, is that although the project is concluding, it's really just beginning. And I think that's an important part of thinking about TCGA, not just as a production thing, but as a resource that really can be mined and used in a lot of different ways and is continuing to impact how we understand and think about cancer. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there's seven data types that were collected on all of the individuals in TCGA, um, most relevant to the sort of NHGRI perspective and what our sequencing center is involved in was DNA sequence. In the end, we wound up with whole um, exome sequencing on all of the cases and whole genome sequencing on about 10 percent, so about 1,000 subjects that had both whole exome and whole genome sequencing. In addition to the DNA sequence, there was RNA sequencing, which also allowed for RNA expression. Copy number alterations were measured from a, um, a SNP chip. DNA methylation, microRNA expression, functional protein assays, and clinical data. Now, the clinical data in TCJ is admittedly limited, and part of what's happening now in NCI efforts is to use TCGA pipelines and approaches in cases that have richer clinical data. But there was a minimal amount of, of clinical data that was collected in the context of TCGA. And altogether, there's over 2.5 petabytes of data in this project. It was really also, in addition to pushing the technologies, it really pushed a lot in the, in the idea of data, data science. Um, <clears throat> as I noted, and part of the reason that we talk about the project has, a, you know, why the project's going to have a continuing sort of legacy post-production is a key dip goal of the project from the start was to have the data publicly and broadly available um, to the research community while obviously protecting patient privacy in the case of controlled access data. And there's both controlled access and open access data and data types within the TCGA project. Um, <clears throat> and to give an idea of the sort of scale to which this data has been used, focusing only on the controlled access data, what people have to go through dbGaP to get access to, there's been um, over 2,700 approved data access requests for the data in the 10-year history of the project, with many, many more people not even going through that process and using the open access aspects of the project. Um, over the his history of the project, this data has sort of lived in different places. Um, in the early part of the project before 2012, controlled access data was in dbGaP. And then open access data was available through the portal. In 2012, while dbGaP as an authorization and authentication method has remained for how you access TCGA data, the actual BAM data, the, the, whole, the sequence level data for both DNA and RNA, moved to the um, Cancer Genomics Hub, or CG Hub with the open access data staying in the data portal. And in 2016, NCI developed the Genomic Data Commons, or the GDC, which now is a single source place to find all of the TCGA <laughs> data, along with other genomic data that's generated through NCI. And so, um, <coughs> so the Genomics Data Commons, the link for which is down here, is the go-to place if you're interested in accessing and using TCGA data. Um, <clears throat> I don't have the slide, I, I feel, after um, Rex's, I realized I probably should have did it, of how many publications have used TCGA data. I chose instead just to go to the NCI Genomics Twitter feed, which is sort of the, 
the follow-up to the TCGA updates Twitter feed and pull some recent examples. These are all papers not done by the TCGA network, but by people outside of the network accessing and using the data. And that really is what we view as one of the greatest um, successes of this project. Anywhere from sort of looking at um, druggable or potentially druggable variants found in different um, genomes to looking at how different types of cancer compare to other diseases. There's a variety of different uses, and one of the things that we talk about that really is amazing to see is the situations where people are using the TCGA data for things that nobody ever would have thought of, and really the ability to come in and do th those types of work with the data is, is very rewarding. In addition to the data, as a community resource, there has also been network-specific analysis done by the funded investigators within the TCGA network. Over time, this also included some people who sort of, I think, volunteered their time. But for the most part, we developed 32 working groups defined by tumor type. For those of you who've been paying attention might have said before, you said there were 33 cancers, and now you're down to 32 working groups. And basically, we just combined the colon and the rectal together, and colorectal actually only was a single working group for that cancer type. Um, <clears throat> these working groups each took the um, number of samples. Um, most cancers had, most of the common cancers wound up with between 200 and 500 cases. Breast cancer, there was 1,000. For the rare cancers, and again, we, had, we identified 10 rare cancer types, there was more in the order of about 50 to 100 subjects. Um, so the, the um, tumor normal samples, the seven data types, and the working groups included people from the genome sequencing centers, um, the NHGRI funded centers, the genomic characterization centers, which were collecting these other data types, the genomic data analysis centers, as well as some of the tissue providers and experts in that particular cancer who did comprehensive characterization of the cancer genome across each of these different cancers. Um, <clears throat> these all get published in what we sort of call marker papers or comprehensive analyses focused on a single cancer type. We've actually now published 28 of these marker papers, eight of them coming out in the last year, um, esophageal cancer, um, pancreas, and uveal melanoma being examples of papers that were published this summer. And the final four have actually all been submitted, and so they're in different stages of the um, review process, and we do hope to have all four of those hopefully out this year, sort of finalizing that network organized analysis on a tumor by tumor basis. Um, <clears throat> key results and findings that have come from these papers, I'm not going to summarize 28 papers worth, but we sort of categorize them into three different areas. One is just the profound understanding about the molecular basis of, can of cancer, the genomic underpinnings of cancer. What are the significantly mutated genes? What patterns of expression do we see? What pathways are heavily involved in different cancers? Um, interesting findings, for example, in head and neck was really seeing a difference between the genomic profile in people who have HPV versus not, how that um, viral cause of the cancer leads to a completely different molecular profile when you look across all the different types. I think to me what's been most interesting is the tumor subtypes and the recognition of molecularly characterizing cancer and looking at how we classify and think about subtypes and ways of cancer beyond, some of which complement and some of which build on histological or other subtypes of cancer. So stomach cancer, for example, they were able to identify four separate subtypes, each of which have different sort of prognostic and therapeutic impl impl implications. And then the paper this summer focused on esophageal cancer actually found that the squamous cell esophageal and the um, adenocarcinoma esophageal are just completely distinct from one another and are, you know, squamous cell is more similar to other um, squamous cell, for example, in head and lung than to other can that other cancer in the esophageal. And then the esophageal adenoc adenocarcinoma is very similar to a chromosome instable form of stomach cancer. And so that type of classification and changing, especially when these types have different prognostic impacts, change how you might approach or treat these, they also really start to change the way we think about informing and designing clinical trials. How do you bucket and bring together different types of cancer or 
or not in the structure of a trial, leading to sort of more modern umbrella and bucket style clinical trials. There's also obviously therapeutic targets coming out of TCGA as we start to identify genomic characteristics of targets that work with currently available therapies or also might inform new drug de de development if we start to find certain genes or certain pathways are highly hit or highly um, altered within a specific cancer type that leads to reasons to think about drug development that would target those pathways in those cancers. Um, so, for example, some of the work coming out of the lung squamous cell carcinoma really has inform informed the current lung map trial, which is working in NCI and looking at specific genomic changes in their tumor. And that's just one example of many sort of precision medicine trials that are happening, many of which are informed by findings from TCGA and other similar studies. Um, <clears throat> but what's been a major focus as well within TCGA at the network level, and again, this is not the, this is also being done by people who access the data. There's been a fair amount of sort of cross-cut cancer projects or what we in TCGA call pan-cancer projects, um, where you look across the tumor types, so not just the single one cancer at a time through 32 working groups, but looking across. And so the first set of these, the PAN-CAN-12, as we called it, was published in fall of 2013. Um, focusing on the 12 cancer types that had a sort of significant amount of data produced at that time. And um, <clears throat> so it was, whoops, I don't know why, I just went the wrong way. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So looking across um, 12 different cancer types and this counting for this project, we actually separated colon and rectal cancer. Um, some of these abbreviations may not mean a lot to you when you work with TCGA enough, you sort of memorize these cancer codes. But the main point, and this is focusing on this slide, just from the sequencing data, what types of patterns and things did came from looking at the sequence data across 12 different cancer types. And so there were key findings, some of which were known, but some of which were highlighted through this analysis about the mutation rate, that different cancer types actually have not different mutation rates or a different frequency of mutations within individuals with that cancer type. Some of this correlates with environmental exposures. So, smoke, so lung cancer and smoking actually tends to have an ex, an, a higher cancer rate than others. There's also um, mutational spectrums or mutational signer, signatures that come out of this where you can actually tie a mutational signature to a environmental exposure. So people who have their cancer because of smoking or have their cancer because of, um, of um, different exposures can actually have a different pattern in the type, the spectrum of mutations or the types of mutations that are occurring in those cancers. We also saw a fair amount about mutated genes. What are the genes that are frequently mutated in different cancers? What are shared in different, but different between cancers when you look at that? What is the um, mutational relationship? In some cases, you'll see that <laughs> there's mutually exclusive cancer mutations. So if you have a specific mutation, you're not likely to have the other. And how do those patterns differ and, and remain the same across cancer types? And then getting also into clinical features and clonal architecture. But some of what's even more interesting than just looking at the sequence data alone is when you do an integrative analysis bringing all of the different data types together and create subgroups of these different cancer types. And so not asking about what are the subgroups within stomach cancer, but saying not looking at where this cancer came from, let's just take the data and have it cluster cancers into different groups. And what do we see when we get, we, we do that? And in some cases, you get what you expect, the ovarian cancer all sort of clustered together as a distinct group. But in some cases, <coughs> you had differences. So breast, um, basal breast cancer and luminal breast cancer were as different from one another as they were from other cancers. And bladder cancer wound up being interesting in that some bladder cancer just more um, sort of clustered with lung and head and neck squamous cancer. And as we move to including the esophageal, now the esophageal squamous is going to cluster in the same group. 
whereas some of it clustered with adeno and some of it was a separate group. And so even at the sort of anatomical level, there's similarities and differences when you say, what do I see about a cancer looking at it genomically versus what do I see using traditional classification? And again, I think this really impacts the way we think about and characterize cancer. So <clears throat> we're moving now from PANCAN 12 to what's in progress, um, which is the PANCAN Atlas, which is what we're sort of considering the TCGA capstone project, looking across the full spectrum. It'll probably be closer to 10,000 cases than 11,000 once we QC and see who has not missing data across the whole thing. Doing a full data analysis and really coming in and not just saying what's the analysis, but how do we do a final summary about standards for data quality, data re reproducibility, what types of batch corrections do we need to do as we move forward and decide to analyze a project that was pretty uniform, but if you think about, again, being collected over a 10-year span with the changes that come into place with that, what types of reanalysis do we have to do? And then how do we also think about really analyzing this size and scope of a data set. You know, each individual cancer was about 500 cases to 1,000, and now all of a sudden we're talking about 10,000 cases. Um, from an NHGRI project perspective, one of the things that we've been helping coordinate, and Heidi Sophia and Melfi Kasapi, who are in the room, really have been leading this on our side, is what we call <coughs> MC3, or um, multi-center mutation calling for multiple cancers. Within TCGA, we had what was MC2, which was sort of not just taking a single caller for somatic variation, but taking multiple callers and recognizing you get a better data set with better characteristic, characteristics in terms of, um, of <coughs> positive and negative predictive values if you use a consensus caller rather than a single caller. There's not one single one that sort of wins out. and so. In originally in TCGA, each of these 32 anal um, groups had gone through and done um, sequencing, and for the last set, maybe start, I don't remember when MC2 started, we had the multi-center calling, but it wasn't a completely consistent set of calls against all, across all of it. And so in order to be able to do this type of analysis, we recognize we need to go back and do multi-center calling across all 10,000 sort of at once. And this involved 500 terabytes of BAM exomes to come up with this uniform mutation calling across all of this data with these multiple variant calling tools and appropriate <coughs> QC filtering and annotation, et cetera. Um, and so part of what was able to make this work was really developing a reproducible tools and workflows project and coming in and having these put into Docker containers using workflow specifications, leveraging clouds and clusters. We actually did leverage DNA Nexus as well. for do, They did a large amount of this calling using open source um, callers that we provided to just use, have a place to do that level of, of computing. And in the end, what we wound up with is a consistent consensus call set across all 10,000 cases with multiple callers that's available um, publicly and is also really going to feed into being the um, variant calls that are used, that's being used for all of these PANCAN analyses. And the themes for this final PANCAN analysis, um, the papers are being sort of organized into three themes. One is oncogenic processes, processes which is really looking at what are the key driver mutations, what are the key um, <coughs> patterns in terms of gene genomic alterations that we see when we look across the cancer. A cell of origin, which is not the best name in the end of what we're doing, but that's where we started doing, you know, instead of just doing stomach and esophageal separate, what happens if we go looking across the entire GI tract? What happens if we look at um, reproductively associated cancers? What happens if we look at all the squamous cell together, sort of reorganizing the, the focus and seeing what we learn from that. And then a series of pathway papers that are really looking at specific pathways that are known to play important roles in cancer and looking across the cancer sets and seeing what do we see similar and different in different cancer types focusing on specific pathways. These papers are in <coughs> various stages of um, final drafts through submission and we're hoping that they'll be 
um, something that'll be published within the next year, knock on, knock on wood. While we've been doing this PanCan Atlas sort of capstone within TCGA, we've also been involved in a separate PanCancer project, which is the PanCancer Analysis of Whole Genomes, or PCOG, as you'll hear it called. And PCOG is a collaboration between TCGA and ICGC, which is the International Cancer Genomes Consortium. And through this project in PCOG, they actually got um, whole genome sequencing on um, 2,800 cancers. So a fraction of these, about 900 of them, came from TCGA with the remaining set coming internationally from, from lots of different countries around the world. And they brought all of this whole genome sequence data together, again, similar to TCGA, took a um, distributed computing, large-scale approach to doing standardized variant calling. This picture shows, um, each, it shows the different um, computational centers that were used um, within the PCOG project, um, <coughs> looking at this, in the end, 2,583 whole genome sequence donors that sort of passed the, the um, final QC and sort of made it to the final analysis where they had over 50 million somatic variants identified across all of those different cancers. The um, final variant calling, e even with this large amount of sort of donated and, and used um, compute, took 23 months to actually do the full set of whole genome variant calling across multiple callers in this standardized format. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that was interesting in the context of this project is you didn't just have technical issues, you also ran into a number of um, both eth both um, ethical and also um, political issues in terms of where can the data even live, like who's willing to have their data go to Amazon if it's going to be in Ireland versus if it might be, you know, you can't necessarily control in some of these cloud systems what country the data is in, and different countries have different regulations surrounding that that led to additional complexities that the group was able to work through and go. And so similar to the, um, the, um, the um, the TCGA effort, this is now in a final stages of, of submission of papers, and so that'll be a second complement or suite of papers with a real focus. In this case, TCGA, we're focusing only on the whole exome sequencing, and this is really, but again, the seven data types, and this is really circled, focused more specifically around what you see through whole genome sequencing. <clears throat> so I think as we think of coming to the end of this, um, this 10 years and into our second decade, you know, the impact of TCGA comes in a different way, in a bunch of different ways. One is I talked about the creation just of this comprehensive data resource that is publicly available and that people are able to pull from and mine and use, I think will continue to have a major impact, not just in cancer genomics, but in genomics more broadly. I think that TCGA has had a lot of sort of forward-looking pushing with data sharing and, you know, the move from dbGaP to CGHub to the, you know, the GDC really has sort of along the way also pushed policy and pushed a lot of questions about how do we do this. You know, the first trusted partners, the NCI cloud pilots, all of these things are really coming about as part of TCGA. There's been transformational scientific advances in terms of our understanding of the genomic and molecular characterization of cancer. And there's also been a lot of transformation and innovation in the pipeline and the approaches. The way that you even go about doing this type of work has really been informed by TCGA. And NCI now is continuing to do a fair amount of genomic characterization, as I said, in studies, precision medicine trials, epi studies, other places that have more clinical data, using the pipelines and approaches that were really sort of developed and honed through TCGA and not sort of reinventing that wheel. Um, just a final thing, there's a little bit of a formatting issue on this computer with this one, but to save the date, there's going to be a cell symposia about the TCGA legacy here in Washington, D.C. a little over a year from now. So if you're interested, please keep your eye out for that and that announcement. We're really sort of seeing this as a, you know, a lot of these pan cancer and PCOG papers that I've discussed will be out at that time and really a good time to sort of come together as a community and really take a look at what 
the legacy and impact of TCGA is. And on that note, I'll just end on my acknowledgement slide. Again, I already mentioned Heidi and Melpi are sort of the current project team, TCGA project team members with me. Um, past TCGA project team members, I certainly would be um, remiss if I didn't call out Brad Ozenberger, who was the NHGRI lead. And then on the NCI side, currently JC, um, Jean-Claude Zinclusen and his team there, and the TCGA, DAC, Vivian, Odawang, and Jeff, who sort of manage those almost 3,000 data access requests that I mentioned. So thank you. Questions for Carol? Carol? So thank you for that of overview. Course. It was great. Um, so do you think that the, um, the uptake of TCGA data by investigators outside of the TCGA consortium, do you think, how, is there a sense of how much that was fostered by simply making the data available, or was it by making interfaces to the data available? Do you, like C BioPortal makes the TCGA yes. data accessible in a in a analysis sort of way in summary way that would be difficult to repeat if you just downloaded all of the TCGA data sets. So do you have a sense of what led to the the uptake of the the data? Yeah, I mean I, I don't have I don't know that we've like studied that as well as we could have in a scientific way, but I definitely think that the excess the ways the investment that's been put into making the data not just available, but really tools and integrated. And I think CBioPortal is a good example. A lot of the work that's coming out of the GDC, they just started a new, it's called DAVE. It's like data visualization. I'm going to get the acronym wrong. You know, are, have been really critical, you know, because the number of people who could just like download the full set of TCGA data and work with it is, you know, um, not that large. Even with the MC3, you know, people who could work with the, the mutation, the multicenter mutation calling from a single cancer set were like, I can't work with this, like, new large thing. And, and so sort of processing some of that in and, and put, making it available, even, even not just the people outside of the network, there's a large number of the people in the network who actually only work with the products from the Broad pipelines, from C Bio Portal, et cetera. And so I think that has been a really critical part of what's made the data um, as useful as it is. And I think it's changing. You know, and now there's some some clinical researchers who are like, oh yeah, I can I can work with a small math file. I can do that, you know, because it's provided in ways that that can be done. Um, Raphael, did you have a question? Thanks for the presentation. So I imagine that you learned a lot, the whole team learned a lot from organizing this apparently very, very complex project. Is there a way for you to pass on this knowledge to future projects? <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we try to do that in, in some different ways. Um, JC and a couple of people from his group actually wrote a book, you can find it, where the, that talks about um, the large, how the management and the types of things that go go into that, um, and then I think it's also, but how to really how to really codify that and do that I think is a is a challenge, and it's one of the things that we try, for example, at NHGRI and NCI also to sort of use the knowledge that we've gained and sort of apply it in other projects. Um, I don't I don't know if you have suggestions or thoughts about specific things that we could be doing in that area. Right now, I don't, but I can. I, I would think you would have more suggestions than me. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, was it on that specific topic, Eric? Or okay. Oh, well, okay. Then continue. I'm going to so. So I have a question along the very same lines. It seems when I think of TCGA, I think that the path from discovery <coughs> to translation was amazingly <coughs> fast and mm -hmm. fairly successful. It was. Do you think that's because cancer is a particular disease because of the role of somatic variation, or are there lessons learned to push translation that NHGRI, for example, just, you know, you think of the common disease program, the CMGs, and, and, and uh, EMERGE, you know, what could we learn about, you know, sort of greasing that, that, that 
pipeline or that workflow from discovery to translation right. that, that could be could benefit all of us. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it was uniquely suited in that somatically, once you you know, can cancer is a genomic disease, right? You know, and there's so much of the under the the way that you can remove a tumor and look at it and study it and really understand that genetic characterization that's more difficult to do in other diseases. You're not just looking at risk or predisposition to the disease. You're actually, see, you're actually um, looking at the manifestation of the, the genomic manifestation of the disease. You know, so for example, in the Centers for Common Disease Genomics, we're focusing on the germline risk factors. We're not able to sort of have a, a cardiovascular equivalent of let's look at the somatic profile of the tumor, at least currently. So I think that's helped a lot in terms of sort of the, the movement to translation because you're then identifying the, you know, these um, genomic altera alterations that you could come in and therapeutically target. Um, I think there's also, you know, some of this is also tied very closely to the existing cancer clinical trial network. And, you know, I think bringing it, being able to bring TCGA in line with these precision medicine trials and I think thinking about how to really find primed either through things we're doing like Ignite or other pro projects for some of the other areas we're working in to say how do we then make that connection to clinical trials and clinical applications is a key part of it. Because it wouldn't have happened from TCGA alone, right? It had to be able to be carried over to that side. And I do think NCI is well positioned to help with that. Yeah, I, I guess I would make a related comment. Thank you. That was really lovely. Um, and I, I do think that, as you just said, right, the cancers that were picked, particularly the early group, were all cancers with very poor outcomes, right? right? And so there was a huge need for better treatment, uh, whereas, frankly, the cardiologists have done a bit better than we have. But you, you didn't comment at all on the germline, so I did yes. just want to comment that there are, because I know members of my group are involved, there's now a very active germline committee, a, ger a pan-cancer germline yes. committee that is now heavily looking into the match normal data yes. uh, and trying to get new insights into cancer susceptibility. So I think that's another area where we're going to continue past this original you know, TCGA effort. Yeah, no, that's true. And yeah, and Deb's one of the people who's definitely leading that, Deb Ritter. And there's, that's happening in both of the, both of the PanCan projects. So this focus on germline, both in the, um, the TCGA um, PanCan Atlas, and then also in the, in the ICGC PCOG. The ICGC PCOG effort gets a little hurt by the fact that they have a much smaller sample size. When you go to germline, the sample size difference and then the whole genome focus. Um, but both of those groups, it's also, I mean, Lisa Brooks has for the longest time been like, you have all this germline data and variants in it, and yes, they do have cancer, but the, the data is, is there. And I agree that's an yet another area where having the data available and the uses, it wasn't designed to be a pro project that worked at germline at all, but that now the recognition that we have. 10,000 whole exome with matched normal. There are some questions about how normal is the normal, but it still is an informative data set to use in those types of ways. Uh, Dan, last question. So I, I, I had to ask Terry this question because I was, I was embarrassed to ask it in public first, but my question to her was, when was it recognized that cancer is a disease of the genome. This is like past history. But when you started, was right. that yes, it well was. recognized? That was well recognized. Well, I don't know. I mean, Sharon, when would you? I feel like it's been known for. Well, as you can say, for 50 years. But, <laughs> but, but the no, idea. I, I think it's because of the classic aberrations. Right like the translocations and endmic amplification. I, I think it's been well recognized, it's been well recognized that we did not know the major drivers of right. the most deadly cancers. I think that's where TCGA really led off with, okay, we know them for these rare tumors, but right. we really don't know them for the common tumors that are causing so a high sort of rate of cancer death. 
Right. But even at like a karyotype level, it's no, you know, it's, it's, it's been well known for quite a while. I, I would have to, I shouldn't, I can't say for sure when it started to be known. I was just, I'm just trying to sort of go back to your comment about so when you started and the genome was $10 million. Right. Off, it, it was a bit of a, an act of faith to sort of walk off the edge of a, walk off, it's like in that Indiana Jones thing. You walk off the edge of the cliff or you, just, or you <laughs> hope that there's something underneath you. There was, for example, the, already the EGFR result right. in lung cancer, which I think was a very uh, substantial one in convincing people that ECGA had moved. No, no, it wasn't like this one. It was like which study was coming up. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there was enough, to sort of Aviv's point, there was enough evidence to know that something would be found from coming in, and especially starting with the pilot to sort of say, you know, we're going to take a look at this. And the, even the three pilot cancers provided enough, you know, by the time it went to the full-scale 2009 acceleration, it was very clear that we were going to have a much better understanding my, from, my, from... My view as an outsider was that there were the pre-pilots, which were things that existed before TCJ, right. were the proof of concept. Yeah. The pilot was about how to actually make it work in a kind of pragmatic way. And then after that. And to, to really scale it. You to know, scale to it, say, yeah. to work within the context of the technology. And I think one of the challenges at the time is that the people who were uh, working on planning for TCGA, they knew that they were on a curve and the curve was moving. Right. And a lot of the, I, I remember people having those conversations on whether to switch from this to that. There were arrays to RNA-seq for the RNA side. There were right. arrays to all exome sequencing for the snipping side because the techniques kept moving and you could, Always wait for the better one to come, and it would come. And so agreeing to continue while, while techniques were changing is one, I think, actually of the good demonstrations of TCGAs that you can do it without becoming paralyzed. But I think before this turns into a love fest, I can, <laughs> I can remember this a Sunday Times front page article that was very critical right. of TCGA. And um, so there, you know, there was a risk involved, and it, 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 it worked out. Yeah. Steve Ellidge wrote an editorial in Science that was highly critical, right? Uh, and that and that was what this New York Times it, that the work should go towards known pathways. And, right. I mean, so there were definitely yeah. And the, another area of critique was actually against the the in, the size of the investment and you know the translated into you know what's the R O one equivalent of the TCGA project and if you compare those where, you know, where are you getting? I think that criticism has really sort of gone away in the last couple of years as the project's really gelled together a lot more. That's not one you hear as much um, anymore, but it certainly was, was there four or five years ago as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn.